Hello, everybody. Oh, it's high. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Renda Slim, and I direct the program on conflict resolution and track to dialogues at the Middle East Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to host Dr. Abbas Qadim today for a conversation about his latest book, uh, The Hausa Under Siege Studies in the Ba'ath Party Archives. Uh, Al Hausa Al Ilmiya is a seminary where Shia Muslim clerics are taught and trained. There are several houses in the Islamic world. The two preeminent ones are the houses in Najaf, which was established in the 11th century, and the Hausa in uh, Qum. There are smaller houses in uh, Karbala in Iraq, in Mashhad and Isfahan in Iran, at some point in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, until the Recently, there was a Hausa in Sayyida Zainab in Damascus, and uh, also in Pakistan, Lahore, Pakistan, and Lokna, India. Uh, since the founding of modern Iraq in 1921 until 2003, Hausa state relations have been tense with the ruling authorities working to weaken the independence and scope of authority enjoyed by the ulama or religious scholars and to exclude their claims to political authority, especially the ones of Iranian origin. After the 1958 coup, Republican government saw the Hausa an obstacle to its programs to secularize society and centralize decision making, especially in the political sphere. The Ba'ath party used different tactics with the Shiite clerical establishment, often shifting between repressive harassment, deportation of some, to co-optation as they have uh, you know, succeeded in some instances. Uh, in the face of the state repression, the Shia clerical class was internally divided over how best to deal with these repressive tactics. There were the activist clerics and merja who chose to confront the state repression. Prominent among them is Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, who paid for that with his life in 1981. And there are others. 1980, 80. right. And there are others like Ayatollah Abu Qasim al khui who opted for a quietest approach. Although part of the discussion is going to really, you know, delve into how quietest or how quiet was the quietest approach of Ayatollah al khui minimizing his public engagement, start focusing on the theological, theological dimension of his profession. So this book by Dr. Qadim, mines the Ba'ath archives to shed new insights into two controversial issues dealing with relations between the Ba'ath regime and the Shia religious establishment. On one hand, as I said earlier, the quietism and how quiet was the quietism of the Marja Ayatollah Abu Qasim al khui and he's looking at documents in the 1980s, 1983 to 1988. And then the nature of the relationship, the second controversial issue, which still is being debated and different Iraqi scholars and experts have different perspectives on it, is the relationship between Muhammad, Muhammad Sadiq Sadr, known as Sadr II, an activist cleric who emerged in the 1990s, led the Friday prayers at uh, the Grand Mosque at Kufa. And he was seen at the time, or accused at the time, as being a collaborator or an outcome of the Ba'athist regime to create um, opposition to uh, the leadership at the time of Ayatollah al khui and later of Ayatollah al-Sistani, who was a student of Ayatollah al khui This rift within the clerical establishment between al-Sadr al khui you know, continued for a long time, and in 2003, the son of uh, Muhammad Muhammad Sadiq Sadr, uh, the cleric Muqtada Sadr, um, according to some, uh, sought to settle the score that existed between him and his family and Al Khui family. So there were reports, uh, not corroborated by evidence, but reports of uh, him having um, called or standing behind the assassination of uh, Majid Al Khui in. April 2003, um, the son of the late Ayatollah al khui and who was one of Sadr, um, Muhammad Muhammad Sadiq Sadr's most vocal critics um, at the time. 
So at this time, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Qadr to uh, share with us the main thesis, the main insights from his book. I'll follow it with a few questions, you know, building on his presentation. And then I would like during these questions also not only to talk about the periods that he covers in the book, the 80s, the 90s, but also to talk about post-2003, the relationship between the Marja'iyya and the state, how it has evolved, uh, talk about um, um, how uh, the interventions uh, that uh, the Marja'iyya directly and indirectly uh, engaged in uh, since 2003 at critical junctures of the Iraqi conflict um, trajectory, and uh, also try to, if we can, push him a little bit in thinking about the future of the Marja'iyya state relations, where we see going forward, especially the issue of succession to Al Ayatollah Assistan. Dr. Abbas. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Randa, for this kind introduction, for the invitation, um, and having me here. I have a soft spot in my heart for the Middle East Institute. It's uh, the, my first talk in Washington ever, 15 years ago was in this uh, institution, and we've had great relation ever since. Um, and uh, that was the work of my good friend, uh, Ambassador David Mack at the time. I was hoping to see him today. But anyway, uh, this uh, book, uh, it is actually part of a, um, uh, an ongoing project, or I would say a larger project. Uh, this is one third of what I have done uh, uh, with the archive, um, the, my work, with the archive was kind of uh, accidental. Uh, I was teaching at Stanford at the time, uh, and uh, the archive was transferred from Harvard University to Stanford University. And I was sitting there, and three, uh, what, 10 million uh, documents uh, were thrown at us out of nowhere, and they are Iraqi uh, documents from the Ba'ath Party. Needless to say, I didn't see all the 10 million documents. Uh, I spent three and a half years uh, trying to do uh, what I could uh, with them. Uh, it would have been a great uh, teamwork if there was a possibility. I lobbied the Iraqi government to send us some PhD students. They had the prime minister's office at the time, Madiki. They had 2,000 uh, po possibilities for students to go on scholarships. But they'd rather send people to study physics and other things that Iraq would never use for the next 50 years. And they didn't want to fund students to go to the United States to study history or our, you know, anthropology or other things. Uh, I thought it was a missed opportunity because an archive like this should have been studied very well. However, I must say that there are some people who did some good work with it. Um, my friends, uh, like uh, Joseph Sasson, for example, wrote a good book on that. Uh, there was also a book uh, by um, uh, uh, Professor Khouri uh, on the Iraq uh, uh, Iran war in the archive, and there were several other works. Some good dissertations were done. Also, now Professor um, uh, Alda Benjamin, she's an Iraqi uh, based in Maryland now, she did her dissertation on that. So, there are certain works, but much less than what we hope for what can be done with an archive like this. Unfortunately, the archive is not well classified. Um, you know, millions of documents were dumped in a small place without resources. There were two Iraqis, young men that were working on it when I was there. They were very helpful, but they couldn't do much with the resources that they had, very meager resources. <clears throat> but there was a digitalization of it. There are many issues about the ownership of the archive because it was brought during the invasion and it, some of it was collected in various ways. So who owns it, who should have it, who should hold it? <clears throat> That's a good, uh, an, an issue. <clears throat> and uh, with the time that I did, um, which is pretty much on my own time, I was going and sitting uh, for hours in the archive of uh, Hoover Institution where they are hosted and would just look through them. And you have to really look at folder by folder to see what happens and what you can stumble on and because you need to find things that uh, fit together in a work. And um, that, was, that was the challenge. There isn't any way that you would do keywords or look at any classification. It's just stumbling on things. Luck plays a lot of work on it. So I thought, 
the best way to do it is to look at what was going on in Najaf because uh, this is a time. Hi, David. I was just talking about uh, Ambassador Mac. Uh, so uh, basically, that was uh, the, the, what happened. And uh, I looked at Najaf and uh, one of those uh, documents that turned as I was looking at the Najaf section of it was what happened with uh, the treatment of Grand Ayatollah Khoui. And since I was in the town at the time, most of the events were very familiar to me. I thought to pursue them. Ultimately, I developed six lines of research. One of them, or two of them, are published in this, uh, in this book. Uh, four others are waiting to be published. They are uh, accomplished. So the full manuscript will have really six. One of them is what happened with the Khu'i in the 1980s. The other was with the Grand Ayatollah Sadr. Uh, in uh, 19, uh, late 1990s, one on the uh, drying on, and destruction of the marshes, an assortment of crimes against humanity and uh, war crimes. Uh, at the time, they, there were some people who deserted the army and they were a position, so they destroyed an entire ecological system that's been in existence for thousands of years just to root out three, four hundred people. The regime didn't like to see them hiding there. <clears throat> Another one was uh, about uh, the uh, role of the uh, Iraqi Federation of uh, Women, uh, uh, which is really the female side of the Ba'ath Party, uh, and what their role in the 1991 uprising uh, was. That I did not publish uh, on purpose because uh, it is ugly and I would need to find a way uh, to publish it without giving the impression that this is representative of Iraqi women. Iraqi women have sacrificed a lot, have been the face of what the oppression of Saddam Hussein uh, on, on the receiving end of that. But there were some who were instruments of that oppression. And even though I coded the name, I didn't bring, and most of the names are, you know, there might be prosecutions, etc. so I didn't want to release the name. But in a way, that is another hot potato that I need to deal with. And there, there is one that is about the city of Kufa in 1986. Uh, Kufa was crucified, uh, and we were there, and we didn't know why that was happening. I mean, it wasn't uh, an, an anomaly that the Ba'ath would oppress a city like Kufa, which is a Shia city, a stronghold. But it went even beyond what we knew. And then it turned out that there was a uh, an organization to assassinate uh, certain officials, and they did uh, do a few things, steal weapons, and then had the, their hands on at and and uh, sorry, TNT and other things uh, to, uh, to, to blow up things so you could imagine. And they timed all of that for the uh, anniversary of Saddam's visit to the, uh, to the city where a big parade and a big celebration was happening. And when Saddam looked at it, uh, he uh, ordered a special treatment of Kufa. Special treatment here meant, you know, really you have to go and weed out everything there is. What got me interested in it is that the people who were involved in it uh, were people who were with me in school. One of them actually my next door neighbor. And, uh, you know, every time I was looking at those documents, a chill goes down my spine. How my name didn't come into the interrogation. Because normally there is, people will have to spit names of anyone they know, and these people will take, uh, you know, it will be taken. So that's that. Now, why the book is uh, in, in two uh, pieces of research, not everything. Uh, I was forced to publish this, actually, because uh, an earlier version of it was published uh, by Boston University. And... Uh, <clears throat> They, you can't, by the way, get the PDF from that, so you don't, you know, the, the English side of it. It's still representative of what's in here, but there was more expansion. So an Iraqi uh, gentleman uh, went and took that and uh, translated it on his own, and he made a mess out of it. Didn't bother, and he's a professor at the university, which was really sad. Uh, didn't bother to contact me or say anything about it. And, you know, I could have at least given him the original uh, text in Arabic that I used. So I translated the text from Arabic to English, and he went and took the English to bring it back to Arabic. And you can imagine how this whole thing, a lot of things where the, the terminology was messed up, a lot of other things. So 
And then here it was, and people calling me saying, you know, I read your book. I said, no, you didn't read my book. You read something else. And I had to uh, do it. So Kufo University has a very good series of books, and they said, we could do that. So I translated it, it ate a year of my time to translate this and, you know, uh, expand on it. It's not really, you see the Arabic and the English version of it, but the Arabic is not the translation of the English. They were written really for different audiences. The English, I wrote it for basically people who read it from a U.S. perspective or Western perspective, if you will. So I had to elaborate on certain issues, explain things. It, I mean, it would be needed to go and explain to the, uh, the other side what I was. So it was written really twice with the same arguments, with the same general points, but uh, each one of them to make it readable and comfortable for the reader it is. So you could say two versions of the same uh, text, but uh, the full text of all six researches that have one thread in them, which is how the regime dealt with the domestic uh, uh, Shia, uh, resistance or opposition. There is a lot of literature on what the regime did with the exile opposition, but with the domestic opposition, there is a lot of um, uh, light that can that can be shed on on that side. And these documents are so. This is one side. The other thing about these is that they are uh, documents that were seen for the first time after the collapse of the regime, and they are the most highly classified documents. The Ba'athists did not circulate them and nobody knew what was going on. So the documents, in a way, challenged the narrative that was written by historians about that era, dealing with questions I'm talking about here. The Hausa and its relation with the regime, the general regime and uh, view of, of the Shia, the general views of, or how they saw the Shia looking at them. For example, one of those things that I was Talk, talking about which sounds counterintuitive. I saw, I saw that there is no evidence that the regime was after the Shia as Shia, but the regime was after the Shia because of the perceived Persian connection, the Iranian connection of those Shia that the regime targeted. Uh, and, and that is a very important distinction to be made because it fit in what the regime was doing as it was dealing with this. Uh, the idea of quietism, for example, uh, in, in that, I say, you know, for example, in, in historians who looked at Iraq looked at two uh, general concepts. One of them is the quietism of the house. And now I wrote before this about uh, this perceived quietism. Quietism is not even a, uh, a, a part of the Shia uh, theology. There isn't such thing as quietism. It is just a matter of trying to deal with the, uh, with the political and social circumstances as they dictate. Uh, when the state is oppressive, the Shia would not go and you know, uh, commit suicide by coming against someone like Saddam Hussein. So they tend to uh, sort of be, uh, be uh, on the uh, quiet side, but not as a conviction that you know, there are people who would say, the school of Qom or of, of Iran is that of a vocal, uh, challenging, in the face of the regime kind of, uh, of, of mood, and then the uh, Najaf doesn't believe in opposition. Uh, that's not true. And if, in fact, if anything we learned from post-2003, it is not true. Uh, however, uh, there is also a, uh, a, a, and we will talk about that later uh, on, on this, there is some truth to the idea that we have two schools when it comes to the scope of the involvement of the religious uh, class between the Wilayat al-Faqih side and, 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 and the Najaf side of looking at different role of the Faqih. That is true, but not in a way uh, you talk about accommodation or, or collaboration with a, an oppressive regime. For example, also this, the, 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 uh, one of those issues here, it's how to redef redefine what it means to be resistant or quietest. If the regime uh, wants someone to uh, keep silent and the person speaks against the regime, that would be opposition. Uh, but if the regime wants you to speak 
uh, on its behalf, and then you keep silent. <laughs> that is opposition too. This is what happened to Khoui. Hazrat Ibrahim himself goes to him and says, we want you to Azad come Ibrahim and serve. Who was Hazrat Ibrahim Duri, who was, deputy was Saddam Saddam's Hussein. deputy. He was yeah. the second man in the Ba'ath yeah. party and in the state. Uh, and he goes, and when Hazrat goes, it means Saddam went. And he told Khoui to come on TV and support the war. He refused. He the said, war, well, the war in Iraq, Iran war, of course. Yeah. And then uh, 1988, and then he goes back to, to him later and says, well, we know you have, don't talk about the war, we understand that. We know that you have uh, differences of opinion on jurisprudence matters with Khomeini. Why don't you come out TV and explain what, how you differ with Khomeini on jurisprudence? Now, who is smart enough to know that the Baathists aren't interested in the semantics of Islamic law, uh, they just want Khoui, the highest uh, authority Najaf. of Islamic uh, scholarship at the time. In fact, not just in Najaf, I would argue that Khoui was higher than Khomeini in all aspects, Correct. other than the political side. Uh, you know, there is no comparison between Khomeini's scholarship and Khoui's scholarship. But uh, they were interested in, in showing Khoui, criticizing Khomeini. So Khoui said, yeah, I can do that. But on one condition, I will evaluate Khomeini and I will evaluate you too. And as that said, no, we don't need that. Thank you. And it ended. That's in fact as that telling a highly classified meeting of the uh, uh, Ba'ath Party Command Council in 1987 uh, in a meeting on Saddam to ask them to go and meet and see how they are going to deal with, with, with Khoui. So what are the documents that are here? It's, they are really, again, you, you look at this. It is not a refutation of what historians wrote, by all means. Uh, historians, I mean, we have Phoebe Marr here, and you know, who is all of us who, who do anything history. Uh, she is our, uh, our teacher and, and our mentor. Um, but uh, it, uh, you know, when you write about Iraq and you don't have any benefit of knowing anything inside or like this, uh, you see what is out there and what is available from open sources. And open sources in Iraq didn't tell much of anything. Uh, and then a lot of the analysis becomes, you know, when you look at how actually the Ba'ath was thinking through these documents, uh, sometimes the analysis doesn't get quite what is there, and that's the point of classification of documents. Every time declassified documents in any country come out, uh, the first victim of the, this declassification is what historians wrote about an era. So. It's not a, uh, you know, a battle with the historians. It is really, I do it with full awareness of the limits of, of what was available for historians, myself included. <clears throat> so in and, and, and that sense. Um, the second part. This, the second part would be with Sadr. Uh, and uh, Sadr uh, is, is another challenging case uh, when, you know, uh, Sadr's movement in 1987 and 88, uh, and until his assassination in February, um, uh, we're sorry, talking about 99 and 97 and 98. And we are talking uh, about Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Sadr, 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 the second Sadr. Yeah. You mentioned that Sadr already. Yeah, yeah, you explained yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Sadr al Sadr uh, decided to uh, re, uh, revive uh, the, the uh, Friday prayer uh, and Friday sermons, uh, and, uh, and, and he decided to do it in a very critical time, uh, right after the 1991 uprising where the Shia rose against Saddam Hussein and the gloves went off between the state and the Shia. Uh, the, uh, also, uh, the, uh, there was a time when the regime was vulnerable, Iraq was being attacked, uh, and under siege, uh, economic sanctions, etc., uh, any kind of uh, opposition to the regime was seen uh, as a, an existential threat. Uh, oppressive regimes become even more oppressive when they are vulnerable and they become weaker. Uh, so people didn't really realize or grasp how that could happen. Um, uh, we see a regime uh, under Saddam Hussein that did not allow five people to gather unless the Ba'ath was their sixth. 
And then all of a sudden, uh, Muhammad Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr goes out in the mosque of Kufa with all of the symbolism of the mosque of Kufa. That's the, the place where Ali ibn Abi Talib, the highest icon of Shiism, governed and, and gave his sermons. Come, comes out and he times it exactly the day after Eid al-Ghadir where it is in the, in the Shia narrative. That was when Prophet Muhammad appointed Ali to the Caliphate, a big dispute between the Shia and the Sunnis. And then he comes and says, nobody ever spoke the truth before me since the days of Ali and I'm going to tell you the truth. He started to get 13, 14,000 Iraqi youth from all kinds of uh, backgrounds and from several governorates, they would come and camp on Thursday, uh, waiting for Friday, and sometimes they began to come on Wednesday because the regime would block the road to Kufa on, on the night of Friday or before Friday, and they would come there to, for the prayer. And the sermons were fiery, they were all critical of the regime. Uh, they crossed so many lines, so people said that couldn't happen, and Saddam is keeping silent and tolerating him. So two dynamics took, took place. One, observers who looked at this, they said, this must be a way for Saddam to let people uh, vent out some steam, and it is a plot, uh, and just to let this, and it is all under control. Another dynamic was more pernicious in my opinion. The opposition who are outside Iraq, who made careers out of being the ones who spoke for the Iraqis, so a challenge inside Iraq. Someone who is willing to be there, in a way it exposed them. Why are you out? Why don't you come back to Iraq and lead the opposition? You are doing nothing other than sitting in Syria, London, or, or, or um, Tehran for that matter, and then doing nothing, and they did nothing all of the time until 2003. The Iraqi opposition did nothing uh, for, for the people inside and except for just writing articles and, and things, mostly in pseudonyms. <clears throat> so what did they do to, to charge back? They said, well, he's the marja of the regime. Uh, you see the Al-Majlis Al-A'la under uh, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Hakim at the time, uh, actually publishing reports uh, claiming that he is working with the regime and that he is uh, the regime's tool to uh, discredit the Shia. Um, you see Al Khoui Foundation in London, where uh, an article uh, written in Al Hayat uh, paper attributing a statement to Sayyid Majid Al Khoui saying that. Uh, Sayyid Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr is unqualified and he's not a merja, he is the merja of the regime. Majid al-Khoui is the son of the Majid al-Khoui, the one you just mentioned yes, that yes, he yes, was assassinated yes, later. Just, in yeah. there. And he was the head of the uh, Khoui Foundation at the time. And then you see uh, pretty much an onslaught uh, of uh, attacks uh, against Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr, uh, undermining his, his credibility. And then also from inside, uh, and, and, and he didn't hold punches also, he went after them. He uh, simply gave interviews saying that uh, uh, emulation of who is problematic, not be as an attack of Sayyid uh, Khoui, Grand Ayatollah uh, Abu Qasim al Musa al Khoui, because he revered him, and there is no one who can really uh, attack Khoui on credentials, but he said, he is being controlled by his entourage, his sons and his, the people around him. And he's just sitting there and they are doing things in his name. And these things are uh, not uh, religiously valid. And therefore, you, if you take their word, uh, you are emulating Khoui and taking their word. What they do and what Khoui orders or would order are different things. He was the one who was speaking about uh, the, the Khoui being uh, silent and all of that. He went against other marjas also, someone like Bashir and Najafi. Now he's one of the big four marjas and Najaf. He said he's not even a mujtahid. So in a way, uh, not that he's not a grand ayatollah, not a marja. He, he went after his, it's just like going after someone who is a full professor and he say his PhD is in question. You know, don't talk to me about him being full professor. Um, and he refused to actually uh, sign on his uh, residency. Uh, at the time, uh, the resident Saddam Hussein always delegated the uh, certification of residency of 
religious scholars there onto that. So uh, those, uh, in, in essence, the escalation was happening. He criticized the regime on services, uh, electricity, etc. He criticized the regime on oppression. He refused to uh, to support the regime and 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 the uh, uh, in its fight against uh, against the UN and and the rest of the world. Uh, to come out and, you know, and, and even they tried to get him to give a, uh, or supplicate for Saddam, make a dua, uh, like all Friday sermon uh, imams would do, and he refused. <clears throat> and finally, he went after the, uh, what was going on in hospitals, and then went, escalated in the week before his assassination to criticize Ali Hassan al-Majid, chemical Ali, Saddam's cousin and right-hand man, uh, for his uh, wide-scale uh, arrests of Sudders, and he said, I give you one week. If you don't release all of these people, we will uh, do different. So he was giving them an ultimatum, which clearly was, was an issue. He began to put even his, uh, the rug where they wrap the dead bodies uh, in, in a sermon. So he was putting there to show, show that he was willing to die. And on uh, the eve of uh, just one day after the last Friday sermon he gave, he gave 45 sermons, 45 weeks, between 97 and uh, 99. Uh, and, uh, well, actually, 97, where his deputies were giving the sermons, he began in April 99, where, uh, 98, where he gave those sermons, and in, in February 99, he was assassinated on 19 February. So that's kind of what, what the documents, again, the set of documents on Sadr refute all that was written, including some credible scholars who, in a way, gave credit to the uh, idea that Sadr was, in a way, in, uh, with the regime. Like some people even looked at certain anecdotal evidence and considered it to be there. Uh, the documents refute that. For example, Pat Cockburn, in his book on Muqtada Sadr, uh, took one incident to say that Sadr was, in a way, uh, hand in hand with the government because the government allowed him to issue a newspaper. And nobody could issue a newspaper in Saddam's Iraq unless they allow him. Uh, well, there is a set of documents that uh, go from the uh, Ba'ath Party to the Ministry of for, uh, Religious Affairs to the Ministry of Information at the time. They all um, asking each other, how could that be published? And they said, we told him many times, and he just publishes it in defiance of our orders. Many other things like that. So as I go uh, item by item, they were all refuted by the documents uh, in, in that sense. Uh, one thing before I, I conclude here is basically uh, on, on these documents. Uh, they are not representative of everything that was happening. I was, the, what I wrote was about the documents themselves rather than going into a big context. Uh, the full manuscript will talk about this and it will expand on it. Uh, there will be also, uh, there, are, there are a few issues that make or, or show the importance of this. For example, with Grand Ayatollah Khoui, these documents begin from 1983 to 1988 and they are regular meetings by everybody who reported to Saddam Hussein. All of the high echelon of Saddam's uh, regime and the Ba'ath Party, the command council, they were meeting regularly on what to do about Khoui, while one of the worst conflicts in the 20th century was going on at the border. I mean, think about the Iraq-Iran War, World War I, type conflict, millions of people were clashing on both sides, uh, hundreds of thousands of casualties over the, the eight years. Uh, each country could have collapsed uh, financially or militarily. And Saddam and his uh, highest aides are sitting and talking about what to do about Khoui. Uh, it shows two things. One of them is that Khoui wasn't really a quietist and he was a potential a threat the Ba'ath, so uh, to possibly make or break their, their, uh, uh, their system. The reason why they were interested in that because the fight between Iraq and Iran was over the soul of Shiism. For the Ba'athists, uh, Shiism was important and, uh, because all of the Iraqi military was standing on the Shia uh, fighters. 
uh, and they could not do anything to Khoui. What saved the Hausa at the time really was this consideration, and it's not my analysis, it's what's Fadl al-Barrak, the uh, uh, head of General Secur Security Directorate at the time, told them if you expel Khoui, uh, we will lose the Hausa, and then all of the uh, the, the narrative that is about Shiism will come from outside Iraq. Now you have the Hausa, and uh, at least if Khomeini says something, you say authentic Shiism is here in Najaf, so used it in Machiavellian way. Uh, the other thing in it is that most of the people who were involved in the combat of the Hausa and in the siege of the Hausa, uh, except for one or two, were Shia Saddamist Shia officials, uh, which is very important. Uh, the Ba'athists, uh, uh, used Shia personalities as tokens. Some of them were really uh, important in the Ba'ath Party. And the Shia in the group were actually the harshest when it came to the recommendations that went to Saddam Hussein. Most of the time, the mild uh, action was recommended by the Sunnis, not by the Shia on the Hausa. Again, on national security calculations, not out of sympathy for the Shia. Uh, but there is more we could talk about in, in that. And uh, you know, fascinating set of documents, uh, fascinating uh, glance at a history that we have not seen, including those of us. I mean, the documents were, and the events were happening three, four houses from my house at the time. And I didn't know about all of that. And you know, I knew the victims, I knew the perpetrators. And looking at those uh, in a time when I was living, we were living in a different world. The Ba'ath kind of kept two separate worlds, the one that we lived in and the one that they knew, uh, which is, again, probably not unique to the Ba'ath party. Um, you know, other uh, highly tyrannical regimes did the same. Uh, but to see it firsthand was, was really fascinating for me. And I hope that those who will read it will see how fascinated they are for, fascinating they are for them. Thank you, Abbas. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bring us to today. You said that in your introduction, in your remarks about the book, that there are, you know, theological dif differences between um, between Qum and Najaf in terms of the role of the jurists in the political, the politics, and the political life of the country. And um, since 2003, we have seen Ayatollah Sistani play a more, not, I would say, an active role, but he intervened at critical junctures from 2004 to 2005, you know, 2014, recently, you know, two days ago, through the statement published on his website, sure. attributed to a source close to him, yes. in basically guiding, you know, the tempo of the political developments in one direction against the other, how does that square with the theological um, approach you know, of the Najaf, the Hausa in Najaf, as to the role of the you know, faqih in politics? Uh, OK, uh, I'll try to sort of be as systematic as I can to show these answers. First of all, uh, the whole idea of Fulayat al-Faqih and whether those who support it or oppose it, it all has its genesis in a simple uh, fact that Shia theology is not centralized. Exactly. Uh, we had a centralized Shia theology from the days of Imam Ali and uh, who became the Imam in 632 AD. Uh, and all the way to uh, the disappearance of the 12th Imam in 874 AD. The hidden Imam. That's Al-Mahdi. So we have 250 years, give or take, uh, of what we call authentic, uh, authoritarian, uh, or authoritative, a uh, better word for it, uh, custody of Islamic sciences, because the Shia believe that the Prophet and all of the 12 Imams are infallible. So no one can give a different opinion to that of the Imam. Once the 12th Imam disappeared, uh, there, was, there are two periods. One of them is called the minor occultation that pushes us to the first quarter or first third of the uh, 10th century AD. And then the major occultation where he did not appear to anyone. In the first occultation, he appeared to one deputy. There are four men who came successively. 
uh, he told them certain things and then they were taken as a second hand, but they were his words. After that, all authority devolved on the clergy, on the scholars of religion. And scholars of religion differ in their opinions and their interpretations, that, and they are all admittingly fallible, which means we don't have that one idea that all Shia have to abide by. So you might see one scholar would give you a theory on something. Another scholar who is co-equal will give you an opposite theory or interpretation. And so long as they are qualified, then whichever you follow, the one that sells his idea to you better, you take that. This is exactly when we talk about wilayat al-faqih versus not wilayat. What wilayat al-faqih is basically saying, what, as long as there was the prophet or the imams, Muslims are, uh, or Shia in this sense, are obligated to follow the imam in every affair in their life and in their religion and they cannot deviate from an instruction of the imam. In other words, he could tell you anything, whether it's for or against your preference, and you have to comply. You don't have that obligation towards the non or the, the fallible person, a scholar, no matter what qualifications he has. Now, Khomeini uh, came, uh, there were people before him spoke about it as a theoretical kind of concept. Khomeini uh, put it into action. Initially, Khomeini's work was theoretical because he wrote this book, uh, Islamic Government, in 1972-73 when he was in Najaf. He had no power to do it, so it was just an exercise of thinking, lectures he gave to his, scholar, his, his students. When he had the chance to frame the constitution of Iran uh, and certain circumstances that happened, especially the bombings that happened, the uh, opposition, so it created the circumstances to put that in and claim wilayat al-faqih. His idea here is that the law is not the law of the jurist, it's the law of God. Whether the prophet administers it, whether the imam administers it, or whether Khomeini administers it, it's the same law. The prophet takes 20% of your excess money, call it khums, the imam takes it and Khomeini takes it. It doesn't mean the prophet takes 20% and Khomeini is less than the prophet and he will take 15. Uh, if somebody who is com you know, committing a certain crime to be given 100 lashes, doesn't mean the Prophet will give him 100 and Khomeini will give him 75. Uh, it's, they are all, these are his arguments, not mine. Uh, now, where it became disingenuous is this, is that Khomeini was going from A to C without going through B. A being he is taking all of this authority that the, the Shia are willing to give to the Prophet and the Imams, and then see they are given to the Imam because he is infallible, that's B. Now he jumps over this idea of infallibility and wants to claim all of the authorities that are given on the condition that the Imam will never abuse these authorities that are given to him. And nobody can guarantee that he will not. And the Iranian experience since 1979 okay. is a good example. That's one. Second is where I got to fall in, uh, you know, in, uh, out of favor with my great mentor and PhD advisor, Dr. Hamid Algar, who supports Wilayat al-Faqih. He almost threw me out of the window. Uh, I said, this is, I mean, again, I was a graduate student, and he's Hamid Algar, one of the best two, three people probably who did Islamic studies in the West ever. Um, I said, look, this is not even a Shia theory. It is the way the Iranians are doing it. It's a Mu'tazila theory at best. The Mu'tazila, for a group of Muslims, believe that it is okay to appoint the inferior so long with the existence of a superior, so long as there is some consultation between the two. The Shia say, no, you have to appoint the superior. That's why they supported Ali for 1,400 years. Exactly. If you don't support the idea that Ali should have been the successor of the Prophet and no other successor was legitimate. You are not a Shia, okay? Now, uh, the, the Iranians come and they appoint someone like Khomeini. Well, yeah, you could go that. Then Khomeini dies and they go for Khamenei. Well, Khamenei stands superior. in the middle of the room and says, I'm not a qualified person. Exactly. He was not a mujtahid even. Mm. So they went through the list and got someone from page 75 of qualified people and they say, this is how you are supposed to give all of your allegiance and authority to this man. 
uh, and this is how the Shia works. Now that's against Shia theology. He is inferior by his admission and by the fact that they had to change the law to make him the supreme leader. Um, to say you don't have to be a mujtahid and a grand ayatollah to, to be there. So that is a so, problem with, with this. Uh, now, so in, Najaf, in Najaf, Sistani. which is Khu'i really, yes. not Sistani, Khu'i never believed in the credentials of Khomeini anyway. In a letter he called him Hujjat al-Islam, mm -hmm. but which is less than an ayatollah. <laughs> um, and there was this, this idea that Khomeini was not even qualified to make that claim and take the Shia into that route. He also believed that the idea of the jurist's role is not to go and challenge the state and make your own state, because here you are putting all the legacy of Shiism in an experience that might fall on its forehead, and then in on the Shia, everything Shia will be blamed for it, yeah. which is what is happening now. Yeah. What we do is we claim selective roles. The jurist will, be, will, will have the role of wilaya, uh, guardianship of those who don't have a guardian, like an orphan. Uh, will have guardianship on the, those who emulate him on affairs that are religious, uh, on affairs that are in the transactions and life matters that they need the religious uh, ruling on them. But he is not going as far as telling Dayman. people to go and live and die because he sees it that way. That's why when Sistani went and gave that fatwa, right. he made it as jihad kifai, not jihad. Jihad, jihad kifai, kifai is... means if some people do it, others don't have to. So anybody who doesn't feel comfortable, he would sit there and let others do it. But it's not a duty. That's not a duty, and if you sit yeah. home, uh, you are not sinner. Yeah. Uh, while if it is jihad period, uh, which was not given since 2000, since 1914, the Shia never engaged in any fatwa with jihad. A hundred years, uh, actually, I asked him when I met him, and um, I met him a couple of times, and I, you know, I told him the last person to ever issue a fatwa of jihad was Sayyid Yazdi in 1914. You come in 2014, hundred years to the dot, a century, and give a fatwa like this, uh, and and he explained to me that first of all, it was not a fatwa of jihad in the general sense where everybody had to go out and, and, and fight because that's only the imam can do. Uh, and then it was a defensive jihad, which means it is not something that uh, you have, I mean, you could even, you don't need a fatwa, you could go and somebody kicks your door, you it's basically pick basically self-defense, yes. preservation of the self community. Self-defense and all of yeah. that. And then the third, it's kifai, which means not everybody should engage in it. Just enough pe people to go, just like a, a state would mobilize a military, but also a volunteer is, military. Can I, can I push yeah. you on this fatwa? Because there is a lot of debate about that. Because, you know, some people say, I mean, eventually some, he will be blamed for the PMF, and we can talk, you know, we need hours to talk about what kind in my opinion, danger the PMF represent long term for the stability of Iraq. But the way he issued the fatwa is not for people to go and join these parallel security institutions, which now are part of the PMF, but rather to go and join security institutions that exist. But at the time, those security institutions have basically imploded. And so there were not that, that, that institutional infrastructure for people who wanted to you know, uh, follow the, the, the fatwa to join, and so they went and did this parent security, institu uh, security structure. Is this a correct interpretation of what happened, or? or, or well, very or, much so. I yeah. mean, the fatwa first, it was issued from the Friday prayer, the yeah. Friday just after Mosul was taken. It was not to the Shia, it was to the Iraqis. Yeah. Okay, uh, to join. So Iraqis means. Muslim and non-Muslim, Shia and Sunnis, and all of that. To join the Iraqi forces, exactly. not to join militias. Exactly. Uh, and that's clear. And the, uh, to defend, and it was, again, he said, just enough people to get the job done. So not everybody will pick their arm and start doing what they needed. And also, to uh, the, the scope of it until the danger is, is out, uh, he and his representative never uh, talked about uh, the, the Hasht or the PMUs. They all say the volunteer fighters, uh, which is clear. 
they never associated themselves with, with the groups because the groups did things in Iraq and outside Iraq, and these are not part of, of what Sistani is looking at. What happened? I was in Iraq in, in July, actually, when, when this whole thing was going on. Uh, people went to uh, join the armed forces. And they could not find a bottle of water waiting for them in those bases. The military disappeared, melted away. Maliki did not uh, have his 100% of the brain on it because 90% of his brain was on securing a third term. This is the problem in Iraq, which is what we are in right now. There is a dangerous time between the election and formation of government. And that's where ISIS took all of that. This is where Basra actually also took. It's, this is a very critical time. And Iraq takes its time to do it. Lebanon does too. Okay. Yeah, so, we have a so, contest going. Who's yeah. going to form the government first? So, yes. yeah. So yeah. basically what we have here is this is what happened. And people couldn't do it. Now, there are groups that are, have been until uh, 2011. They were fighting. They were formed mostly in Iran or by Iran in Iraq. They fought while the United States forces were there, uh, and they dropped their uh, arms after the US withdrawal. Uh, but they did not disappear. When they dropped their arms. Most of their uh, fighters left, uh, but the uh, leadership remained. The skeleton of each group remained, and the connections remained with, uh, with Iran. So some of, and this is not Kadam analyzing. It is basically, they tell you that they are uh, paying allegiance to Iran and to, to, to um, a revolutionary guard. Uh, and since people wanted to go and fight and uh, get rid of ISIS danger, the government is not there to take them. So uh, the order came to these groups to set booths and take people. Uh, where do you want to go? To Jarf al Sakhar in the outskirts of Baghdad? We will take you. You want to go to Samarra? We will take you. You want to go to Beji? So they divided uh, the areas in danger as areas of operation or responsibility, AORs. And each one of them took that and took control of it, took uh, freelance if you will, uh, government uh, for, or forces initially. Maliki thought it would be of utility, so he established a, uh, an organization with the prime minister's office just to give it a little cover, and that's what happened. Now, these were the first three, four people, uh, th three, four groups initially, the ones who were there, Kata'ib, Hezbollah, Asa'ib, Ahl al-Haq, Badr, uh, and, and they were there. Better was different in a sense that it turned into an a political organization from the beginning. It didn't really engage in the fight against the US forces. And uh, after that, because of the need, the huge area that Iraq needed to defend and needed to also go after ISIS, you needed more organizations. So uh, there was an open season on anyone who wanted to make an organization. Some were made by the Sistani organization, like the shrines of Imam Ali, for Imam Not Abbas, al Hussein, etc. Uh, they uh, also there are uh, tribes that made their own. Later on, you had Sunni tribes making their own PMUs, and then later on, you have Christians making. There are three Christian PMUs, and Kurds also joined. Yazidis joined. So, you know, the PMUs became a 80, 90,000 uh, man force, uh, and it is really of everything. They took a life of their own, they mushroomed, and the task was needed. Now it is a matter of how to contain that. That's not Sistani's thing. This is all the dynamics of the state, the dynamics of the nature of the conflict and the threat from ISIS, and the fact that Iraq has been. I mean, when the, the, these, these groups were formed in between 2003 and 2011, there was no fatwa. I mean, they were there, and they fought, and they did a lot. I mean, 1,000 uh, of the three, uh, or, or almost 1,000 of the 4,000 US soldiers we lost were killed you know, in Shia areas. So, uh, you know. Uh, these are, these are groups that were there, and Sistani, again, tried to do it. There is a law now. Abadi kind of didn't go as fast as I would have hoped to see on implementing it. He waited until last minute. And since that he's not going to be there to implement it, the question is who's going to implement this 2016 law, exactly. which actually was supposed to tackle the problem of the PMUs and uh, make sure that they are not part of the Iraqi uh, problem, but they are part of the Iraqi solution. 
uh, Abadi just didn't want to go against the Hashid, and uh, I wouldn't blame him. I mean, he, he had so many other things to do, but he kicked the can down the road, and now it remains to be seen how its final status will be and how it is implemented. I mean, if they decide to put their own man, now they are running for, for elections, and they are... Uh, they might they have a big say in who gets to be the next prime minister they will be implementing their own law uh, which is what abadi has facilitated so uh, in terms of uh, succession you know at the time of grand ayatollah al-khoui ayatollah sistani the grand marja was there you know everybody knew that he was going to be the successor right now we are hearing of four names you know among you refer to them the grand marja or the ayatollahs so uh, how do you see the succession evolving? Is it already in place? Uh, are people around this merja starting to compete, you know, to set the ground for their own merja to ascend to that position? How do you see that happening? I see the process of succession is, is much more, uh, is vaguer than, than in the case of Hui, for example, and Sistani. Well, a uh, couple of things. Uh, succession, First, uh, we don't have a hierarchical system in Iraq, unlike, for example, or in, in Shiism, uh, unlike, let's say, in Catholic Church. Correct. You Correct. have the Pope, you have the Cardinals or Council of Cardinals, and but then... The sorry to yeah. interrupt, but in the case of Hui, I mean, Sistani was already there. No. But he was the favorite. I mean, he was... He was favorite, yes. He was the favorite. Yeah. We knew that... But it what took was, about a year or so yeah, before but, Sistani became... Yeah, but, yeah. Who, but everybody knew who Hui wanted to succeed him. Correct? Let me back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, since we don't have that system, and since we don't have actually a job to appoint someone to, yeah. what it is is that when you know, every Shia is supposed to follow a living marja when he starts, and then he, if the marja dies, he can stay with him or pick another person, switch that is. Uh, now, the death of the marja um, will present this question, whom am I going to follow? Then there are two criteria for that. Piety, which is a reputation, and then scholarship. You have to uh, pick the one that everybody says he is the most qualified scholar. Both of them are arbitrary, actually, and both of them are by reputation. Uh, there, these, this is the only criteria. Uh, the person uh, doesn't even know that people are following him. There is no office he holds, and none of that is there. So what do you do? Uh, a merger dies, people will start looking around. Who are the best people in the establishment? Uh, most cases, with maybe one or two, ex uh, or one or two ex exemptions or ex exceptions in the past 200 years, where there was one person, everybody knew, if this dies, this person will be. Or we knew who the Marja, who the Grand Ayatollah wanted to yeah. su him to succeed. Yeah. Uh, or he wanted, but even with wanted, it remains a, an analysis because no Marja ever said, I want this no, person after me, because then yeah. he is, you know, it's a kiss of death for that yeah, person. Yeah. So let me, uh, you know, in, in a way, people will start looking at that, and you will see them following one, two, three, and finally until one of them is consolidated. Uh, in cases sometimes, in the old days, people ran away from it. I mean, there are this case of uh, Ayatollah, uh, after the death of, of Mirza Hassan Shirazi, they went after him and said, okay, why don't you come? And he went to Masjid al-Sahla and did what's called a'tikaf, where you stay for 40 days, you don't talk to anyone. It's like a religious practice. So yeah. they couldn't go to him. Yeah. They had to pick another one. Sayyid Hakim died. They went to his son, Sayyid Yusuf, and he was well, well qualified. He said, no, I don't want to inherit my father's, and he left. And that's how Khu'i became the, So that's how, how it happens. When Khu'i died, Khu'i lived for a long time, and Khu'i was a huge name. No one could really fill his, Correct. his space. Correct. Even when Hakim was alive, Sayyid, Muhammad, uh, Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, Khu'i was the, the chief scholar in the Hawza, Za'im al-Hawza al, al the only one who got that title while Amarja was living. Uh, so he became sort of that. But even with Khui, he didn't go unchallenged. Um, the Shah wanted to play a trick in Najaf and wanted Khomeini to be established. So he got rid of Khomeini by having him engaged in Najaf. So he ordered all of his uh, friends in the house of Qom to send condolences for the death of Hakim to Khomeini. 
Najafis picked it and they said, we don't want a carpetbagger to be there. So they got around and they declared Khoui. Uh, it, it's always that. Now, Sistani dies, Saddam was in probably died. The, uh, sorry, uh, Khoui dies. Uh, Saddam was in, in, in the heyday of his, his, his uh, sort of craze and, uh, and uh, paranoia and oppression. Who would like to be the next person under Saddam's thumb? So all of them just recoiled. They had a couple of people who were in their 90s, were followed, say, Sabzavari, then the Gulbagani, et cetera. And they were kind of, if they die, they were dying anyway. Uh, until a year or so, and then Sistani came, and with the help, of course, of the uh, sons of Sayyid Khoui. And the Khoui Foundation. Yeah, and the Khoui Foundation. But since Stani was well qualified, the thing is, there, were, there was nothing at stake. Correct. Being a merger is nothing more than answering a question to someone who slept overnight with some situation, and what does he do when he wakes up in the morning? Now it's different. Exactly. For the first time in exactly. 1,400 years, at least in 1,000 years, where it matters who becomes the merger, because the merger now in Iraq is the turbaned king of the country. Correct. In the old days, nobody wanted it because there was no privilege in it, no gains. Yeah. Now, there, are, there is so much that is wanted. There are people who have militias who would like to have backing. Correct. Worst of it is the ones who will jump unwanted are the least qualified. But also the regional players. That, and, I mean, yes, Iran regional wants Iran to Iran would involved. try. Yes. Uh, people inside Iraq will try. Yeah. Other countries. So it's huge. Uh, the, the person now who is going to be Sistani, I mean, Sistani leaped. Uh, it's almost what Sistani did to the, to the Hausa is what maybe the internet did to our knowledge <laughs> in 10 years, you know, where what we used to do things and what we are doing now in those 10, 15 years. This is exactly where, you know, the, 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 the grand merger wasn't even on. Sistani had a position where the, you know, the, the UN Secu Gen Secretary General would go and ask to visit him and ask to take a picture with him. Uh, he would send a message to the UN Security Council and ch they change the language of a resolution. Uh, he is, I mean, the only reason why Sistani uh, is not, you know, another Khomeini in Iraq is because he doesn't want to. But if he wants to do anything tomorrow, he would do it. Also, the expansion, we were talking before we sat here, about the expansion of the functions of the house. It's no longer just a jurisprudential system. Now they are dealing with uh, politics. With water they pumps. are, you know, water <laughs> pumps. He just sent his, you know, in a state that is completely dysfunctional. This is not the job of the merger to send his top aide who gives the Friday sermon to go to Basra and see what breaks the, you know, this is a job of an engineer working for the government. The government is not there, so they went and gave water to the people. They are uh, spending millions of dollars on charities that are uh, mostly doing government job, not charity job, uh, a lot of that. So those and the idea that people are always going to them, just before the election they ask, uh, wh whom should I vote for, who is the person? They've been trying to be vague, giving general rules of what to do, but never naming names. But in general, as much as Sistani practiced self-restraint and admirably withheld himself from jumping on all of this power that is available in Iraq and beyond, he went and sort of he, he tried to push back. Uh, the question is, will the next person exactly. do that? Okay. Or will the next person is willing to be as flexible, as inclusive, as interfaith oriented kind of person? And all of the things I say about Sistani are genuine. When I sit with him, it's only him, Sheikh Ansari, and myself, three Shia. I have not heard him once say the word Shia. He always says Iraqis. And what you hear from his office is what I heard as an Najafi Shia from him. This is his inner and outer. I sat with all of the other marjas in Najaf. I did not see that coming so, across to me. So it's fearful uh, moment or fearsome moment if you are coming to who is going to be next to him. We can't say who will be next to him because we don't have a mechanism. 
uh, the other people who are apparent, they are as ill as he is or as old as he is. Sayyid Saeed al-Hakim, for example, uh, is a, a marja, he's his colleague, they both studied under Hui. Uh, the question is, he is in the same situation like Sistani when it comes to health, when it comes to uh, age, etc. cetera. Uh, Sheikh Fayyad is in a better health, he's a great scholar, and uh, the question is, Will the Najafis finally have someone who is not an Iranian or not an Arab in Najaf? Ashab uh, al-Fayyad is an Afghani. The Afghanis are always uh, in Najaf are marginalized. They don't have that clout. Um, but quality and, and qualifications wise, Fayyad is every ounce Sistani is. Uh, that's an issue. Would somebody will come from the second generation Correct. and be there? There are so many names. Uh, I mean, one of Sayyid Sistani's son, uh, the, not Sayyid Muhammad Rada, but Sayyid Baqir, he's one of the great scholars. He's younger, uh, second generation, he's well qualified. Uh, the question is, will they be willing to do that and take it into a generation. past yeah. generation? Will there be someone who is close to Sistani's office and we will keep the same uh, infrastructure, but a new merger? Those questions historically and traditionally never get discussed in public until the merger dies. Mm. My preference is may God keep Sistani alive until we sort out issues with Iraq mm. because uh, really his death, first of all, no matter who the person after him will be, uh, he will need 10, 15 years to be anywhere near where Sistani is now. And these are very critical years, the vacuum that will happen. We might even have two, three people uh, who are going to be there. Correct. So there will be no one authority that will hold people in the moment. Moment like mm -hmm. June 10, 2014. Correct. Correct. Moment like, uh, you know, the, the, the moments where the bombing of, of uh, the, the shrine in 2005 and 2006. You know, when I met Sistani, I was writing something on him and I asked him a question. What, are the people you, you want history to remember you by. And I listed a lot of his accomplishments and all of that. He said, forget all of that, it's nothing. It's when the, the mosque in Samarra was bombed and delegations came to me and said, say the word and no Sunni will be alive in Iraq. Mm. And I, I did the opposite. I brought all of the other three marjas and we issued a joint fatwa saying, don't retaliate even if you see us being killed. Second is when Sayyid Muqtada and the Americans were fighting in August of 2004, uh, 2004 and the bullets were hitting the Imam Ali Shrine and that would have been another civil war. And I came from London back, he was at the time having a heart operation and I stopped it, no one else could. And Sistani. Sistani, yeah. did, yes, not me, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I assume that people know that. Uh, I'm and sorry. then uh, we the, have uh, yeah, the, uh, the third uh, part of it, uh, or, or the third, it's when he called for elections. Correct. And these are, so when I, I met him in 2000. Uh, when he called for election in 2004. Yes, Correct. and when I, uh, when the, who to get to write the Constitution. Yes. And when I met him in 2018, as I said, I said, I remember when I said, what are the things? He said, yes. I said, you told me three, is there a fourth? He said, yeah, the fatwa. So, you know. This fatwa? Yeah, this fatwa, because wow. I met him like yeah. two weeks yeah. after it, yeah. uh, in August, huh. uh, or three weeks, something like that. Huh. So in a way, uh, this is how, he, in fact, this is even not only how we see him as scholars and observers, it's how he sees himself. Correct. Correct. Which is highly important. Correct. Is he doesn't look at his accomplishments in writing and fatwas and all of that. He sees his, appoint, his, his role in what he did for Iraq in this critical moment. And it is important to see someone who evaluates himself on his performance that way rather than see it as an entitlement. And if you look at each of them, it's basically a it's taking a national stand rather than... Yes. Correct? Yes. At each of these times, starting with the election in 2004, calling for the right of the Iraqis to choose the Constitution Committee to, drive, you know, to draft their uh, Constitution. In 2004 uh, with Sadr, I think this is where things might... 
it's not necessarily national as much as no, he trying was more to interested in, in, in cutting uh, the uh, or, or stopping a, a disaster in the making because yeah. uh, neither the US government was willing to concede defeat correct and nor uh, Sadr was and uh, you didn't want in 2004 in yeah. the those worst days to have a uh, Sadr's son with all what Sadr meant at the time, Sadr at that time was only his family legacy. He didn't Correct. make his own legacy. Correct. To be killed inside the shrine, shrine of Imam Ali. That is like, think about that. So simply, uh, you know, it was in fact, uh, you could say uh, there was a national uh, dimension to it. But it's, uh, that's how he saw himself. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yes, sir. I don't think we have, do we have a micro? Yes? Yeah, okay. Yes, sir, uh, my name is Kami, but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator, and your research pretty much reflects that Saddam didn't have any deep-seated hatred against Sh Shia, and Sadr and Muhammad Sadr didn't have any deep hatred, say, uh, 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 hatred against Sunni. So my question is, is there anything in Islamic jurisprudence that strictly prevent or forbidden the Muslim killing of Muslim by another Muslim, uh, like Shia and Sunni, as I'm asking, because in, see, in Pakistan, you know, this guy, Imran Khan, is a very secular person, but he appointed a Marzai or Amdi, and whole Sunni are making a lot of noise. The reason is this, that the Sunni come from very dysfunctional family, or they are very socioeconomically, very suppressed, suppressed background, so they need enemy to survive or to make themselves leader or make feel good. I'm Sunni, I don't mean to trash them, but this is, I mean, reality of life, that these people uh, are coming from dirt poor background and they want to be leader, and the only way you could be leader when you have enemies. So you, you are, if you are Shia, so I'm sure that if Imran appoint any very qualified person, Shia person in the government, the Sunni would make noise. So again, my question is, is, isn't there anything in Islamic laws that prevent people to kill Muslim, Shia by Muslim, Sunni or Sunni by Muslim? Because, I mean, this could be a very question. positive force, like Reagan used this force against Russian. And the Muslim would, I, I, I assume, they would keep hating Jews because that's what you are taught if you are a Muslim, to hate Jews. And they, they could use this as a, but I think killing Muslim is Muslim kind of, is beyond comprehension. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, we cannot really talk about Islamic law as a monolith. We have schools of Islamic law. There is Islam and there is the corpus of Islamic thinking and jurisprudence. That is the uh, production of thousands of scholars over more than 1,400 years. Uh, and uh, Pakistan is not like Iraq because the difference of the makeup of the social uh, and, and religious uh, makeup of, of the people there. In Iraq, we don't really have, I mean, the, the genesis of killing within the religion is, uh, comes from this idea of takfir, which is, you know, you consider others are non-Muslims, non-believers, and once you consider them non-believers, they are upstates because they are already, I mean, Hassan is here and he is the guru of, of those, uh, those issues, but in general, uh, once you think that this person is a Muslim who exited Islam, uh, then uh, you, know, you start having all of those rules about what to do with them. And then people sometimes, you know, they take matters into their own hands, saying because the state doesn't do it, so they go and be freelance uh, administrators of, of the law. Uh, Iraq has been a uh, more of uh, you know either Shia or you have Hanafi and you have Shafi'i traditions from the Sunni side. Neither of these engage in the takfir, and even when they engage in the takfir, it is no more than a description of a person's condition, but they do not attach an action to it. Uh, so that created a uh, tolerance. That is not the case where you have schools of Islam, for example, that will weaponize those fatwas. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on Baghdad, one of the PhD programs, uh, uh, on, on Baghdad in the 11th century. Hanbalis were in charge of Baghdad. And the moment they see something like this, they would go and they engage in violence, and you saw uh, 
Hardly a month went back in Baghdad without a riot with people being killed and having their belongings confiscated. So I think it is not that Islamic law versus, uh, you know, whether it has it or it doesn't. It's also all, what kind of a version of Islamic law that you have. Is it a, uh, is it a more of the um, uh, tolerant one in the Hanafi tradition or in the Shafi'i tradition or in the Maliki tradition or is it more of the strict like the Hanbali one and even with Hanbalism there are strands of Hanbalism the worst of which probably is what came later on after Ahmad ibn Hanbal with uh, works of people like Ibn Taymiyyah then Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and then their, their disciples where you see uh, you know, fatwas of killing people and going all the way to the 1970s, people like Sayyid Qutb and others, where you know, they even found ways to go around killing people who are ipso facto innocent or people who are not kafirs. When they were asked, well, you are putting a bomb in the market and you, know, you are not really killing it. They said, well, no, yeah, th these are people who are not uh, going against a, an unbelieving ruler, so they are complicit. <laughs> and then finally said, but what if they can? They said, well, if they are good people and they really got in the wrong place in the wrong time, then they, God will put them in heaven. So we did them a favor in a way. Uh, and, and, you know, if you were to justify things, there is no place where you can stop justifying. At the end of the day, it is really not something that to be blamed on Islam or even on all Islamic schools. That's where then. So Iraq, for example, for centuries didn't have that kind of problem with takfir and killing and suicide. Because we don't. But after 2003, for example, or even in Saddam's later days in what he called the faith campaign, mm -hmm. where he brought some Wahhabis mm -hmm. and others and they mm -hmm. spread out a lot of money and then they radicalized people just in the late 1990s. And what you see later on in 2003 is the graduates of that Saddamist school of faith-based uh, ca or, or faith campaign. So that dynamic. And of course, you know, in, in South Asia, there are the Diabandis and there are others who really took uh, those teachings and a lot of cross-fertilization. Many of them go to Saudi to study or others. And you started also, there are some scholars from that part of the world who had you know uh, some radical thought that was uh, you know that really made those people most of it is really a combination of uh, sinister work uh, mostly politicized and ignorance on the part of the uh, the people who received this thought um, but you can't really blame it on Islamic law or on Islam uh, otherwise we would see it across the board Correct. which we don't uh, yes. Coming. Yeah, uh, David Mack from the Middle East Institute, and, and uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think it's high time people in this town pay more attention to the Shia community. Um, and uh, there's such a lot of ignorance, uh, not just in the government, but I mean in very often academic circles and the media and so on. Um, and, and I think anybody who wants Rather than asking you a question about the Shia community in Iraq, well, I'm just gonna read your book um, and urge people to do that. But what did the researches you've been able to do in the documents from the Hausa and interviews, what did that show you about the Ba'ath Party regime? I mean, I agree that Saddam Hussein, kind of the ultimate pragmatist, if he had to use repression, torture, he would, uh, execution. But if he could use diplomacy, bribery, public works projects in Najaf and Karbala, or appointments into the government, he'd use that. But there must have been some other people in the regime who were pushing for less tolerant, I have to say more religiously biased approach to the Shia community. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Yes. Uh, now, one thing to your question is that a lot of what Saddam was thinking, uh, we find it in the documents because he wrote with his own handwriting on these documents. Uh, and uh, also the uh, meetings of the 
uh, command council. I mean, these are Saddam Hussein, Azat Ibrahim. Saddam was not in these meetings, but clearly he was reading everything coming out of them and commenting on it, as we saw in the documents. But those people with Azat Ibrahim, uh, Saadwan Hamadi, Saadwan Shakir, Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi, I mean, names everybody knows, and uh, you know, they, were, they were in it. Tariq Aziz was the only one who wasn't, who wasn't in those, um, uh, which was interesting. Exactly. Um, uh, Why do you think? Because he was a couple of things. First, affairs. because he was more on the foreign yeah. affairs side, yeah. and also he was a Christian. Yeah. They yeah. didn't want to involve him in an Islamic question, really, and I think that was part of it. Um, but in in general, um, uh, the most people who really pushed for a hard line were the Shia on the command council, not the Sunnis. That's across the board. Second, uh, and I think the reason for it is because they were, uh, you know, in Saddam's time, your credentials uh, is, is a matter of something you have to prove. Who is the, uh, the, bur the burden of proof on whom uh, is on the Shia to show that he is loyal? So someone like Muhammad Hamza Zawadi, you know, a Sunni of, uh, minister could order torture. Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi would torture with his own hands, film it, and send it to Saddam Hussein. And we saw that I served in the Iraqi military. We always liked to serve with a Sunni officer rather than with a Shia officer, because a Sunni officer could go lenient on you without being second guessed. The other guy has to go harsh on you. I write that here also. Uh, that, is, that is the case. Uh, so it is, it is a problem. The second thing is the documents don't lie. I mean, these are things that the Ba'athists were telling one another and they were not anticipating anyone will ever read them other than them. And they did not talk in terms of Shia Sunni. They talked in terms of Persian Arab. Even when they wanted to find a solution for the problem, they wanted to uh, Arabize the Hawza, textbooks and all of that. They wanted to, to, even there was a moment, I talk about it, when the Ba'ath party tried in a plot to plant their own Ba'athists to go and study in the Hawza, and hopefully one of them will, Become the with a strike of luck, yeah. will be a merger and will be their own merger. And Father al barak said, for 20 years we tried and we couldn't do it <laughs> in, in one of those documents. Uh, they, uh, and and, and that, is, that is an issue. They also tried to have, to move the Hawza from what kind of mechanism that one of the questions was, to make sure that a merger will be an Arab or Iraqi, not a Persian merger. Now, Arab and Iraqi, these are semantics because at the end of the day, they are talking about identity and loyalties, not because Sistani and Khu'i before him, these are descendants of Prophet Muhammad, the most Arab anyone can get. Uh, but because their families have been on, you know, uh, in Iran for one reason or another, they are considered to be uh, Iranians or, or uh, Persian in a way in the language of the Ba'ath. So it is that, Sistani, I mean, you live here five years, you become an American. Sistani lived between 1950 all the way to nine, until today. So uh, what is that, 70 years, 80 years? Uh, and uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, and, and still he's not Iraqi for them. Uh, so in a way, I think these documents reveal a lot about the Ba'athist thinking, you are right, Saddam wasn't a, Shia fan a Sunni fanatic, not even a Sunni by any uh, description. He was a Saddam fanatic. That's why he didn't have a problem blowing up uh, Adnan Khair al al Fah, who is his own cousin. They grew up together. Two of his sons-in-laws, who were who in law, sorry, who were his cousins as well, and you know, the fathers of of his only grandchildren. He killed them. Uh, he went and killed so many others. His brothers always banished them or this that. So he is all about himself. And he also had some Shia who went all the way. I mean, a Shia in Saddam's time became a prime minister and many others. So it is, yeah. yeah. I don't know I if I would you... like to, go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Kravitz from Insight. It's fascinating. And I'm going to pick up on the ignorance uh, comment from Ambassador Mackin. I'm not going to ask you some I'm going to ask you some basic questions because I don't want to betray my own ignorance. I want to ask you yeah, first. Everything but ignorant. No, I know no, that's you. not true. But thank you. Coming from you, on the documents, both at the Hoover Institution and, and others in um, 
in, in Iraq that I understand that were handed from the Americans to, to the government and some of them apparently are still, you know, sort of literally in containers. Yes. I'm wondering if you won the lotto tomorrow or you had a magic wand that you had the resources, if you could tell us what it would take to study them, to study these documents, what, what would you do, you know, what would you like to see happen? And the second question is, back to your neighbors and, and others that you knew. Have you talked to them since after you've seen this, these, these documents? I mean, ha, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, let me pick from the easier part, the second one. Uh, the neighbors, I cannot talk to them because they were killed. They, uh, yeah, but I spoke to their families, definitely. And uh, one case, which is a sad case as I look at it. Uh, one of the brothers of a friend of mine who was killed and uh, taken and executed, he is now in the um, Iraqi uh, intelligence um, security part. And I told him, uh, he's an officer, how is it there nowadays? He says, it's the same, it's just we now on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just sad to see that people are, we, and this is one thing, I, you know, a theme that I picked from my book on the 1920 revolution, uh, which is, you know, one of the uh, Iraqi uh, scholars uh, wrote, he said, Abbas Kadam gave us a plot of Iraqi history uh, that was not in the other histories. Each one, I mean, we have everybody who gave us a, a history. And the thing that I brought is, he called it the plot of burying the brother. Uh, so the, uh, the Sunnis basically buried their brothers, the Shia brothers. They were all fighting the 1920 revolution together. Before it, they had all a resistance against the British. And then after the to revolution and the, with the formation of the government, you had a government with seven Sunnis, one Jew, and not a single Shia. Uh, so, uh, and then they buried the, the, the Shia politically, which later on, opened the idea to burying them physically and throughout the history with mass graves and all of that. You first bury them politically, take all of the power from them and they're able to resist, which facilitated their burial physically. And you know, my fear is that the, we are not correcting that history by eliminating the burial of the brother. It's just we are changing the roles between the guy who is in the tomb and the guy who is standing on top of the tomb. The worst thing Iraqis would do is to reverse the roles and now the Shia bury their Sunni brothers. We don't want that. We want them both to stop burying anything. And that is the problem. So the families, uh, I speak with them and, uh, you know, it is, uh, I mean, we have, this is part of the Iraqi life. My, my own family, we have, my wife had three men in her family, her father and two brothers. We don't even know where their graves are. So it is a typical thing for Iraqis. And it's, uh, when you talk to them, you open all of that history of, of oppression, et cetera. To, to our question on these documents, I was hoping uh, that we study them more systematically. In a way, we studied the Jewish archive, for example, in Nazi Germany or that. These are archives that are no less in, in, you know, in, in compar uh, comparison. Um, you, you could study them politically, you could study them uh, socially, you could study them, you know, sometimes there is one or two or three documents about one case that tells you a story. I mean, I know we are limited on time, but take a look at one thing. Uh, a, a, two minutes. Two minutes. I will do a try in less than two minutes. Uh, in, in, uh, 9 May 1983, a group of Ba'ath Party gunmen would go to a small marsh uh, local in Kufa. They pick a few people, uh, they were there, and normally th that's where deserters of the military w will go. They pick them, and the mar morning of the 10th uh, of May, they will execute them on the spot. There was a law in Iraq. You desert the military in Iraq. Iran war, you, get, uh, you don't need to go to court. They just execute them. So it turned out that one of them was the son of a high-ranking Ba'athist. They called him and they said, come and take your son. He goes, and why did you kill him? They said, don't talk. Take him, bury him, no, no funeral, the whole nine yards. So he wants to know. He sends a letter through his rank and, you know, the, the chain of command. And it lands at Hassan Rah al who was the commander of the central Iraq or the middle Euphrates. 
He inquires and they tell him, well, he was a deserter of the army. So he gets called to the office and they said, your son was a deserter of the army. Why did you embarrass us and make us? He said he's, eight, he's 17. He's in the 11th grade. He's not even old enough to become a um, conscript. Uh, and, and, uh, conscript. Yeah. Uh, so uh, then uh, he goes through months and months of trying to get them to change the death certificate of his son from execution to death by mistake. Because then if he's executed by this, the whole family cannot get jobs, etc. He wants just to take it. He's not asking, why did you do it? It goes all the way to Saddam Hussein. What does Saddam Hussein do? He doesn't order an investigation or anything. He just says, no, no problem, change the death certificate. Then Abdul Hassan Rahifur on the guy who was taking the charge, felt sorry about him, and he sends again. Another request goes all the way to Saddam Hussein to give compensation for the family. Actually, they called it a help and assistance, not compensation. Um, and what Saddam does when he, he writes 60 dinars, that's $140, for killing someone. 17-year-old. 17-year-old, uh, completely the fault of the state. In three hours, they picked him and they killed him without allowing him to say what, you know, to defend himself. And it's $60, no one, no investigation. That puts you in the mind of how the regime dealt with people. But, but it's not question. a big case like that. What do you do with that? But Someone Abbas, can study it as yeah, a case but, study. I don't Abbas, know. quickly, the question is, if you have the resources to do it, what is the best way to go about it? I would do two things. I send people. I would never send it to Iraq. Uh, you will not send them back no, to Iraq? No. I, I said it before, and I got in trouble because of it, and I keep send it, saying it. Uh, there are so many names of people, many of them are in government now, where documents show that they committed sinister acts. There are a lot of people who can read the uh, letter and the handwriting of a person who actually betrayed their own brother and got him to execution. All of that is there, and if you get there, it's a recipe for a civil war once they are open. Also, once you send them, they can be monetized. Anybody who gets out of him, yeah. he will go to these people and say, give me this money. There are even foreign people. There is a document on some member of the Bahraini family who was working for the Iraqi intelligence, in a way. There are so many others. You know. So I had, in, in some of my work, I had to put codes for the names. I only revealed the names of people who are tried or who are well known. But there are so many average people, thousands and thousands of them, who are quote so unquote. So you would not send citizens. them to back I would not send them. I would send as many uh, PhD students as possible or researchers to go and go through them and write books. Uh, I would even give grants to people here based in the United States who can read those documents. A lot of it is handwriting and it's awful to work with. You need special skills. But there are people here in the US, including Americans, I saw students, etc., who are good at it and they did some good work. But this has to be studied from a multidisciplinary way. And it, you know, I, if I were in charge, I would put a good amount of money in grants and scholarships to have it written. There is a lot of Iraq's history that can be told to us. And a lot of Iraq's history that is already being told to, uh, to us that we can revisit it and negotiate with it in the version and in the narrative that was given. It's all about narrative and counter narrative. And these documents are a treasure. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Kazim. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.